Welcome everyone to a webcast on early learning brought to you by the Ministry of Education Early Learning Branch. Today's webcast is entitled Self-Regulation, What Is It and Why Is It Important for Learning? We have with us today Stuart Shanker and Jane Bertrand. Stuart is from York University and Jane is from George Brown College. Stuart and Jane have much in common. Both are researchers, teachers, authors, consultants in the area of early childhood development, and both place the learner at the center of all the work they do. Both Jane and Stuart have presented to us in BC, Stuart as recently as November, when he presented to the, at the superintendent's conference, and Jane has been a presenter at our interactive conversations, so those webcasts have gone right through the province too. Jane is also currently advising the Coquitlam Mission Early Learning Working Group. The overwhelming response from you, the audience, both in our studio today and around the province, indicates to us the importance that BC places on the wisdom of Jane and Stuart and their work. Stuart and Jane, we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to our conversation with you. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. We are living in the midst of the most extraordinary revolution in educational theory. The Papers are coming out at such a furious pace that it's almost difficult for us to keep up with the most recent discoveries. In fact, just this week alone, there have been three papers, major papers, published on the material that Jane and I will be talking about this afternoon. And uh, the good news is they, uh, they all substantiate everything that Jane and I are going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. And we are very happy about that. Today, we're really going to be looking at three broad overarching themes that guide our presentation. We're going to talk about the long reach of self-regulation in early childhood into adolescence and adulthood. We're also going to talk about the relationship of self-regulation and self-control. And finally, we are going to try to illustrate how self-regulation in early childhood sets the foundation for learning, behavior, and health across the life cycle. We thought we would begin by briefly discussing this paper that was published in the year 2005 by Angela Duckworth and Martin Seligman. This paper had an extraordinary impact on scientists working on educational trajectories. What I mean by that is what we're very interested in are those children that, are, that we find it very difficult to enhance the direction in which they're moving in school. And what Duckworth and Seligman showed was that self-discipline is actually a more important factor than IQ and other social variables in predicting how well a child is going to do in school. Now, perhaps the most important aspect of this paper was that the average age of the children involved in the study was 13.4. And what they found was that the kids at this age were not only doing better in school, but a lot of their school-related behaviors were significantly better than the children who demonstrated poor self-discipline. This raised a very important question for scientists like myself, and that is, how did these kids get to that point? How did these kids develop such robust, such strong self-discipline by the time they were young adolescents? With that in mind, the very first thing we began to look at was temperament. And temperament is obviously enormously important in why some children go on to develop uh, strong self-discipline. The thing you need to understand about temperament is, yes, it's something that we believe a child is born with, but we now look at temperament in very biological, in very physiological terms. In other words, we look at things like how a child reacts to stimuli, or whether or not a child seeks out, craves certain kinds of stimulus. So for us, what's important isn't the temperament per se, it's how we respond to these different temperamental variables in order to develop or help the child develop their self-control. And that's really very much a key, as Jane mentioned at the outset, that's very much a key uh, uh, theme for today's presentation because we now know that first, self-control is something that a child develops, and second, it's an enormously important predictor of how, well, how much self-discipline that child will have by the time they become an adolescent. 
With that in mind, we thought we'd tell you about a study that was done in the late 1970s that's been replicated many times by Walter Mischel. It's called a delay of gratification task. It's a very simple task. You take a little child and you present them with two plates of marshmallows and one has a single marshmallow on it and the other has several marshmallows on it. And you say to the child, you can have the one marshmallow right away or if you wait until I return in 15 minutes, you can have the plate with several marshmallows. What Michel discovered was that about 30% of all four-year-olds can wait. Well, that's pretty interesting in itself and if you're a parent, I know you're right now thinking, my child couldn't possibly wait. <laughs> uh, I, I must just tell you briefly, uh, my son recently found a video of me on YouTube where I was talking about this, and I was mentioning on the video how I have two children, a six-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old boy. My six-year-old daughter would wait for several hours. In fact, you'd be, have to be careful to come back and remind her that she can now eat her marshmallows. My son, on the other hand, would grab both plates. <laughs> So my son was watching this and he was laughing and he said, that's me, that's definitely me. And then he said to me, you know what, I really feel like some marshmallows now. <laughs> In fact, my son's, my son's behavior is a good predictor that he will develop good self-discipline by the time he's a young adolescent. Simply being able to look at this little vignette about himself with, with uh, a sense of humor and good reflective skills. So when we talk about self-discipline, or even when we talk about self-control, we don't want to think about this as being some sort of harsh regime we want our, our kids to uh, adopt or embrace. In fact, it should always be fun, something that Jane will be speaking to quite a bit at the end of this uh, uh, presentation. Now, when we examine the long-term predictive effects of Michel's uh, tests on four-year-olds, the most extraordinary finding was made. The 30% of four-year-olds who did well on the task scored on average 210 points higher in their college entrance exams. This is a very, very striking discovery. And it wasn't only that. What Michel also discovered was that these same children were much less vulnerable to risky behaviors, much less vulnerable to engaging in addictive behaviors, they had much lower incidence of social, uh, of social aggression or conduct disorder. They, had, they, they were functioning at a much higher rate of social acceptability. So it was clear that something very important was going on with these little kids. And what was extraordinary was that they were differentiating already by the age of four. That's a very striking discovery. Now for us, for scientists, it raises a huge question. Really two. The first one is, how did these four-year-olds who did so well on the task, why did they do so well? How did they get to that point? And then the bigger question, what about the other 70%? The 70% of kids that really were having trouble with self-control. What can we do as educators and as parents to enhance their self-control? And when I talked at the very outset about the revolution that's occurring in educational thinking, this is the key that we now believe that if we get to these kids early and if we continue to reinforce these kinds of lessons that we're learning, we can have a dramatic impact on each and every child's ability to self-control. And as a result, a dramatic impact on their long-term physical and mental well-being. So now we want to put you to work to do some thinking about the kids that you are working with or have worked with in the past. Think about those kids that you interact with on a daily basis. Describe the really exuberant kids in your classrooms, full of life and energy, and sometimes that energy can be disruptive. Sometimes it can take a lot of your energy to, to cope with that in your classroom. So think about those kids. What are their characteristics? What is the impact of those kids on the rest of the classroom environment? Next, we want you to think about what if their behaviors really push your buttons? Um, and how do you respond? What is, what is your gut reactions and how do you manage that? Then finally, we want you to think about those kids that fly beneath the radar screen of your attention. 
those kids who, at the end of the day, you'd be a bit hard pressed to think about uh, what, what activities they engaged in or who they interacted with. And now I think we're going to, Kathy's going to send us into small groups to discuss that. I'm going to. We're going to take a few minutes to let you have some discussion, both uh, at where you are and in our studio audience. We're going to keep the cameras going uh, to show you our studio audience. And if, it's, uh, if you have a group and you'd like to not hear our discussions, just turn your volume down and tune us out, and you can tune us back in in two minutes. We'd like to remind you, too, that the questions that you are going to be discussing, you should find in your participants' uh, handout that you have downloaded. And don't forget to keep those questions coming in to us. We'll see you again in two minutes. One of the questions we have today from our live audience is from Andrea in Coquitlam. And she's asked, where is the balance between routines, creating safety, adult regulated, and a child's self-regulation? I think Stuart's going to have a go at that one. Oh, well, it's a question that I love because mm -hmm. it really uh, gets to the heart of all the work that we do at my institute. And essentially, the starting point for our institute is that a child is born with a very, very small brain. And we study things like what's in this little tiny brain when the child is born and what's not in that brain. At birth, a child's brain is really only between a quarter and a fifth the size of its mm -hmm of its adult brain. So what we look at is, we look at what's, what are the driving mechanisms, and they are largely reflexes in the newborn's brain. They are things like ordinary physical reflexes or motion circuits. A child has four of these, four primitive emotion circuits, anger, love, curiosity, and fear. What the child doesn't have are those mechanisms for regulating its fear or its anger once that reflex is triggered. We call these systems, we call these systems the regulating systems, the executive function systems. And these are the things that develop postnatally. And they develop at an extraordinary pace. The child forms around 700 new synapses every single second in the first year of its life. Now what's fascinating about this scientifically is that what has to happen, what is the fundamental unit for the development of the child's brain, for the development of the child's capacity to regulate its own emotional reactions, are its interactions with its primary caregivers. We talk about the dyad as now being the fundamental unit of early brain development. So what does this mean in terms of this question? Well, it means something very simple. It is only by being regulated that a child develops the capacity to self-regulate. It is only by being in these very intimate, endless interactions with, its, with his or her primary caregivers that the necessary information is delivered to those parts of the brain that are exploding postnatally so that those systems can begin to take on that function itself. We mentioned uh, before the break that we do see a considerable number of kids coming into school with problems in self-regulation. In fact, we have data coming out of the U.S. suggesting that as much as half of all children are having challenges in self-regulating. What does this mean for teachers? Well, it means that, as Jane hinted right before the break, you have to be performing this function for a large part of your day. You are exercising, you continue to exercise this regulating function so that they, on top of everything else, are learning how to self-regulate. And it's difficult to self-regulate in a classroom environment. It's difficult for them, and it's also difficult for you. It's, it's a very, as every mother will tell you, it's very demanding, it's very tiring to help regulate a little baby. It's demanding to be a teacher who has to do this with a classroom of 20 or 25 kids. Want to add something to that? I think that's a, a really good answer. I just summarize it. It's, think, it's about thinking about being a flexible spine, being able to give some structure and some support, but being able to be responsive and give some room for the child. So it's, it's a developmental dance. It's a dance back and forth and trying to find the fit to put in the, the routines and the safety conditions absolutely essential. As, but to give children room that they can cope with and, and uh, in, in their environment. And there is no one answer. There is no 
10 tips on how to do a balance between uh, the, the, what's put, the child's uh, self-regulation and the guidance you must give, but it's trying to find your, your way of introducing that flexible spine into the classroom. Well, thank you, Andrea. That certainly was a powerful question. Really nice answers, thank you. Um, we'd now like to continue with Jane and Stuart in the conversation about our role and some of the things we can do when we're working with early learners. Thank you. I'm going to now talk about that relationship between self-regulation and self-control. For a long, long time in our history, and in particular, uh, we have thought about this and misunderstood it. Really, the development of self-regulate of self-control sits on emotional, attentional, and behavioral regulating skills. We don't develop self-regulation by being self by developing self-control. It's the other way around, and I think that's one of the first things we need to address and and think about in our practice as we go forward. We have to recognize that it is much more difficult for some kids to acquire these skills than others. It cut, takes a lot more energy. Stuart's going to talk about that in a moment. I think it's a bit like learning some motor skills. Some things come easier to some kids than others. It took me at seven years, two and a half months, to learn to ride a two-wheel bike. And my sister did it in two days. Uh, we were clearly at different levels of readiness, and it took me a lot more energy to, and a lot more effort to coordinate the various uh, body parts one must coordinate to, to ride a two-wheeler. And, and I think we need to translate that on into, uh, into our um, thinking about self-regulating skills. Uh, well, I have to be very careful now because Jane just said some really great things and I'd love to spend an hour just talking about what she said. <laughs> um, uh, she made a hugely important point for this presentation and that is that, that uh, self-regulation and self-control are not the same thing. Uh, Jane and I have been working together in Ontario uh, trying to get this message through because Ontario has adopted an early learning program which has highlighted the importance of self-regulation. And there is a bit of a tendency to confuse self-regulation with compliance or to confuse it with self-control. In fact, as Jane just said, self-regulation is vital for the child's mastery of the various skills. And uh, her bicycle example is actually a really, really good one because uh, it highlights that these skills are not just cognitive, not just emotional, but, and not just social, but also they are motor skills as well. They are all a part of this. And self-regulation is the sort of energy reserve, the reservoir that makes it possible for a kid to confront these challenges. So what exactly is self-regulation? It's a very important question. And there have been various attempts to define it, not entirely satisfactory. I think we've pulled up one which uh, it sounds nice when you first look at it until you realize it's actually not saying very much. It's circular. Um, what we want to know is can we, can we break this down in such a way that we can then begin to look at those experiences, as Jane just said, they're going to be very variable for each and every child that will help improve, enhance their ability to self-regulate. So what we do at our institute at York, uh, at Mary, is we have broken self-regulation down into five distinct levels. This schema is, is, a, is a very useful way to conceptualize the relationship between the various levels. It works in both a bottom-up and a top-down manner. So let me just give one quick example to explain what that means. We know that the better a child can self-regulate at that first biological level, the better they'll be able to regulate their emotions. But conversely, the better the child can regulate their emotions, the better they'll be able to regulate at the first level, which is the level of arousal. So each of these levels builds on the earlier ones, but likewise they have this sort of reverse downstream effect on enhancing the child. We don't have time to do each of these levels 
uh, we would need a separate webcast for each level. So <laughs> we decided that what we're going to do today is concentrate on the first. And the reason that the reason for that is because the first is really the most important, especially when we're looking at little kids. What we want to know is how well can the child regulate its arousal states, whatever that actually means. When we look at arousal regulation, scientists define it in terms of two systems, two competing systems, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system which together act as a sort of uh, fuel pump and a brake. What the child has to do is every time the child confronts a challenge, they need to expend energy. They need to draw on their energy reserves in order to meet that challenge. And then what they need to do is they need to recover. That's the point of these two systems working together. And we have to remember that for a small child, everything is a challenge. So, in fact, just looking in a mother's eyes is a challenge for a little baby. And for some babies, it's a much greater challenge than for others. What does that mean? It means that for some babies, the arousal is so great because they're very sensitive to visual stimulus. The arousal is so great when they look in their mommy's eyes that they need a lot of rest to recover from this. They have to have these experiences. They have to have these face-to-face, uh, -face, these eye-to-eye -eye interactions in order to begin to learn about the world, to begin to begin to learn the meaning of a facial expression or of a sound. But if a child is expending so much energy just, in, just interacting with mommy, they need to rest, they need to recover. So that's what we mean when we talk about these two systems operating together so that the child can meet the challenges of learning how to sit up, learning how to walk, learning how to talk, learning how to gesture. Um, and uh, the last point that uh, Jane wanted me to make was that this is not, um, it's not a binary thing, it's a continuum. In other words, what's happening throughout the day is that the challenges that the child is dealing with are constantly either greater or lesser. It's a constant movement that's going on here of spending more energy, of spending more time, of spending more time recovering from that. Now we'll explain carefully after the next break what, how this really bears on the development of self-control. The key point here is that not all kids have to make the same effort. Some have to make a lot more effort. Not all kids find it as easy to recover from their effort. Some kids find it much more difficult. And this gets to the heart, as we'll explain next, of why there is this very tight connection between self-regulation and self-control. Oh, I, uh, Jane just reminded me. <laughs> uh, this is actually the most important part. <laughs> so, thanks, Jane. Welcome. Uh, Jane's used to me. Uh, we so, we co-regulate. <laughs> that's level four. We're not doing that today. <laughs> Uh, so we use this model. This is a model that goes back to Barry Brazelton in the early 70s, um, where, we where a child goes through six stages of arousal. And we really wanted to draw attention to a very important point about this. What the stages of arousal tell us is that the ideal stage for learning to occur is level four. In fact, uh, Neuropsychobiologists have shown that at level four, the modulation between the two systems I was talking about, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, is most finely regulated. What that means in, in, in English is that it's at stage four where the child has the most resources to pay attention. The longer the child pays attention, the more the child learns. The more the child learns, the better the child self-regulates, the better the child's self-control. Now. What this graphic is telling us is that self-regulation is a story that goes in two directions. Suppose I've got a child that's at level three in, your, in, 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 this, in this model. Level three is when the child is a little bit hypo-aroused. And he's hypo-aroused, as we'll explain afterwards, because perhaps the stressors are a little too great in this kid's life. So he shuts down a little bit. He avoids interactions. He daydreams a lot. 
but we need that kid in level four in order for that kid to learn. If I've got that kid in class, I don't want him staring out the window. I want him engaged, fully paying attention to me. I have to upregulate that kid. That child needs a little bit more energy to engage and keep his attention. Suppose I've got a kid that's in level five on that model. This is the kid that's a bit hyper aroused. The kid that, this is Jane's, what did you call it, a really exuberant child. Okay, that child needs to be down regulated. What we need to do with that child is figure out how can we bring him down a little bit so that he's in level four too and keep him in level four so that he can begin to learn. And the more he's in level four, the more he will begin to take this over for himself. The more he'll learn because he will enjoy the experience of being in level four. So the last point I'll make about this is just to come back to what Jane was saying. In her two questions, uh, uh, in the last two questions that she asked, she drew attention to the really exuberant kid or the kid who's flying beneath the radar. The really exuberant kid is the kid who's at level five. Mm -hmm. Or hopefully not level six, but sometimes it's gonna happen. The, re the kid who's flying below the radar is the kid that's at level three. So the point that she wanted you to take home was that when we talk about the importance of self-regulation, that you are every bit as aware of the kid who is chronically in stage three as the kid who is chronically in stage five. In fact, at my clinic, we are absolutely every bit as much concerned about the kids that are chronically hypoalert as the kids that are chronically hyperalert. Okay? Good. Okay. Thank you. Now we're going to go back to you and some discussion. We want you to take this idea of the five levels and the hypoalert, the hyperalert, and calmly focused and alert children. Think about those really exuberant kids again and describe their, their stages of arousal. Do they sometimes go over the top and flood, as in completely can't cope and, and crying and tantruming and that sort of things? Or, and, and what is your stages of arousal when that happens? Do you withdraw? Do you get more hyper? And is it different? Is your classroom different? And are your stages of arousal different when those children or that child is away? We also want you to think about what strategies you use and are they effective? As well as thinking about the exuberant kids, we want you to also ask yourself the same questions about kids flying beneath the radar. Perfect. So, thank you for those questions. We're going to now uh, spend some time in our studio audience discussing these questions. You're welcome to stay with us and listen to us as we discuss them, or you're welcome to tune us down for a few minutes and discuss on your own. Keep those questions coming in. We have some incredible questions coming in through Question Manager. So keep your questions coming in to us, please. And we'll see you, well, you'll see us, so we'll come back to you with sound from our presentation again in about two or three minutes. Thank you. Welcome back That's to good. us. Welcome back. We've got two questions from the field. We're not quite sure whose questions they are because we don't have names on them, but they're still good questions, so here we go. Jane's going to look at classroom management in a very active classroom is a challenge. How does one adult face negotiation skills and self-regulation behaviors for many children all at the same time? You just be truly magic. <laughs> Simple. Uh, well, this is the art of being an educator and an educator with young children. And that is in, it can be informed by the science, but there is an art and it's what skilled teachers acquire. The, the whole idea, there's another question about can children truly learn when they're, when they're being active? And I wanna tie these two questions together. I think it's really not possible to support kids' self-regulation and learning if you don't have an active classroom. A quiet classroom does not equate with either learning or self-regulation. It equates with compliance. And for it, so I think we need to unpack that, accept the challenges involved, but really understand that everybody sitting still and doing the same thing at the same time 
um, is, is means that many kids are not in that level four. They've dozed out. And there are still going to be the nudgers, the pokers, and, and who can't contain themselves. Neither group are learning. So I want to thought, think about how you manage a classroom, how you organize a classroom, and how you interact to really and truly try to maintain an environment that is a learning environment and not drive yourself star grading mad. I think there's three things to think about. First of all, the emotional climate of the classroom is so important. Your responsiveness as an educator to individual children, the respect you give them, is sets an emotional tone, an emotional climate that is essential across the spectrum of children. And that, I think that's job number one. Job number two is really organizational. Some people call it classroom management, but it's the organizational stuff you do to have things at the ready, to have planning, to be seeing forward, to be thinking about how to organize things so that they're efficient. The tools for learning are readily available for young mm -hmm. children. And how you organize the routine and schedule so it makes sense. Uh, and third of all, I think there are the kinds of pedagogical strategies or instructional strategies that you put in place to be able to rate, uh, relate and interact with a range of learners and that you're able to do the dance. You're able to reach and, and, and connect with a whole variety of learners, uh, and whether they're jumping up and down or, or sitting still and that you're able to bring in pedagogical strategies that require children, that encourage children to be interested, to ask questions, to want to solve problems. And I think those are the three aspects, when you put those together, really can support a very active classroom, good self-regulation, and lots of learning. Thanks, Jane. Stuart. Was there something you'd like to say? No, to well, that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just keeping me regulated. Ah. So, Stuart, a question has come in that you're going to tackle for us, and it's a two-part question about a child perhaps not eating a balanced diet and perhaps children who don't get enough sleep and how this can kind of come into play with the, with the conversation we're having today. And the person has also asked, where in, in the stages you discussed would you think that these kids might be? Uh, I was fascinated by this question because whoever asked it has gotten to the heart of what we're trying to convey today. Um, and one of the things that Jane and I decided not to talk about, but we might have, is that this is really not a story about willpower. Uh, in fact, one of the worst things that we can do is send a child home with a report card saying, you know, Johnny has all this potential, but he needs to apply himself more. <laughs> it's not that the kid is somehow deficient. It's not that the kid is somehow to blame for his poor behavior. And this is something we'll, we'll explain. This question gets at the heart of the fact that this is a story about what kind of energy reserves the child's going to have during the day, and, and the question is absolutely right. Um, uh, my wife right now uh, is begging me to stop eating um, fatty foods and salt. Th those are things I have, to, I have to eliminate. And they had this fantastic buffet at the, <laughs> at the hotel this morning, and I saw this beautiful bacon and sausages. And, uh, and I knew it was full, full of nitrates and fats, but I slept well last night. <laughs> and because I slept well, I really had no, had no temptation. Uh, it wasn't that I was afraid that my wife would find out. <laughs> um, and, and that's the key. And if you're interested in this, uh, there's a fabulous book written by Robert Thayer, T-H-A-Y-E-R, called Calm Energy. And mm -hmm. anyone who's ever struggled mm -hmm. with a diet uh, in their life will never feel guilty again. In fact, as Jane <laughs> hinted a second ago, a negative emotion like guilt makes everything a lot more difficult because guilt or anger or frustration burn energy. Whereas the other emotions that Jane talked about, interest, curiosity, happiness, actually fuel energy. It's the irony, the paradox of negative versus positive emotions. So I love the first part of the question, now the second. This is a serious issue. We know that our children are chronically underslept. We know that chronic undersleeping dramatically exacerbates problems in self-regulation. Now we have to be realistic. 
go back in your mind to that model you had, the stages of arousal. Suppose I've got a kid who for one reason or another is hyper alert, it's really Spencer is chronically hyper alert, and I've got to get that kid to sleep. If I do it in an aversive manner, if I, if I, if I put the kid in his room and tell him, shout at him, go to sleep, uh, A, it's not going to happen, and B, it's likely going to end up in him going to level six. He's going to flood. He has to be down-regulated, step by step. And we have to be very sensitive to the fact, knowing as we do as educators, knowing that we have a tremendous number of kids that are underslept, we have to be, we have to be sensitive to the fact that there are so many stimuli in our society today that are leaving these kids hyper-aroused at bedtime. What we don't want to do is make things worse for their parent. What we don't want to do is say to them, you know what? You've got to get him to sleep. You've got to do whatever it takes. You've got to down-regulate him. You've got to rub his back, and, and, but they do have to do it. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to, be, we have to be gently encouraging to parents to help them want to do it. We have to get them to see that this is a special experience that they'll have with their child, gently helping their child to down-regulate when it's bedtime. And believe it or not, it doesn't matter how serious the kids' problems are. We know this from clinical experience. Every kid can learn this. Every kid's going to see, if you do it over and over, it feels good to down-regulate. It feels good to slowly relax and go to sleep. What we have to do is we have to make this a really pleasurable experience for everyone, for parents as well as child. But whoever the questioner was, you're absolutely right. It's a serious issue, and it's one that the Canadian Pediatric uh, Society is taking very seriously now. Our kids are chronically underslept. Well, thank you. Keep those questions coming. Great questions coming into us. Now, let's go a little bit deeper and learn some more about self-regulation. Uh, what we thought we'd do is, this is not the easiest concept to come to terms with, and so we have a very nice analogy to help you understand what we really mean when we're talking about these two systems, the activation system that was involved in upregulating a child, and the inhibition system that's involved in downregulating a child. So, the way we originally thought of this was, I live fairly far from the university, and I drive along the 401 and I put my car on cruise control. Mm -hmm. If I set the car at, uh, uh, well I never do this, but let's say I follow the speed rule and set my car at 100 kilometers per hour. I can then look at my instantaneous fuel readout and I can see how much fuel I'm, I'm expending at any moment. So when I go up an incline, I use up around 40 liters per 100 liters, 40 liters per 100 kilometers. But when I'm on a decline, it can go down to three or four liters per hundred kilometers. In other words, you're constantly fluctuating. On top of that, what we want to th think back to is when we were learning how to drive. Okay, so remember that very first time that you had to get onto the freeway, what it was like joining these cars that were zooming by. In fact, that's what social interaction feels like to a lot of kids. Things are moving very fast for some kids this is incredibly difficult. They have to burn so much, not just because they may be processing a little slower, but also because they become very anxious. And as I just mentioned, anxiety burns fuel. So it's a, it's a sort of exacerbating condition. Now, think about when you were learning how to drive in rush hour. Think of how hard it was to constantly sort of finally modulate putting your foot on the gas pedal or putting your foot on the brake. And if you were like me, you were probably constantly jerking back and forth and begging my father to stay in the car and I won't do it anymore. But it was hard. <laughs> it's hard to get that smooth fluctuation. Now you do it without thinking. That's what social interaction, that's what, that's what engaging with his social world is like for a child. And what's fascinating about this is that for some children, this capacity to make the smooth transitions between gas and brake is much more difficult than others. So scientists call this optimal regulation, James put it up. Optimal regulation essentially refers to how smoothly the child can produce enough gas for learning something which is challenging and then enough brake to feel when he, when he needs to recover from the expenditure. 
when people talk about self-regulation, kids who, who self-regulate well, this is really what they mean. They mean optimal regulation. They mean the kid who makes these very, slow, these very smooth transitions from, from gas pedal to brake. For us, the concern is the kid, and this is a very large number of kid, uh, a very large number of children that have trouble with optimal regulation, whose transitions are too abrupt or inappropriate for, I, I, I need Jane's help here. When did McEwen write, um, I guess about 20 years. Um, Bruce McEwen. 20 years, <laughs> stress, brain. Yes, yeah, about 20, 20 years. years. So for about 20 years, we've understood that kids who have problems with these smooth transitions can be in what's called an allostatic load condition. And I want to just briefly explain what this means. Essentially, this is a story about stress. And what it means is that a child who has too much stress in their life, and we're talking about little children here, a child who has too much stress can have a lot of difficulty making these smooth transitions. It could be that what happens is their transitions are too abrupt or inappropriate. They respond in a stress, in a stress, in a fight or flight manner to something that needn't have provoked that response like ask, answering a question in class. Or it could be that once stressed, so the child, let's say, who does have trouble um, reading out loud, even though he could do it, becomes so anxious and so stressed out by the experience that they have a lot of trouble returning back to baseline. So for us, when we look at these children, when we talk about these kids being under too much stress, it's very important that we understand, that we define what we mean by stress. Stress is a complex concept. Stress refers, for us, when we talk about, you know, I had a stressful day, we really mean, you know, I was, my boss asked me to do too much. But for children, the stressors, which is what we're talking about, the stressors can be biological, they can be social, they can be environmental. What does that mean? Right now, I told, I told Jane uh, at the start of this presentation that she and I, and you, Kathy, uh, we're going to be very tired at the end of it because they have bright lights on us. We have to work very hard to concentrate on what we're saying and on inhibiting this, mm -hmm. this visual stimulation. We're working, we're working twice as hard as you. So <laughs> if, if you think your head hurts, it's nothing compared to what Jane and I are going through. <laughs> so, but, but, but when we talk about stressors for a child, we really, we really to begin with, we're worried about their, their nervous system, how they respond to sounds or sights or smells. For some children, just a smell can be incredibly taxing for their system. Then we have to look at family stressors. This doesn't need explanation. It's a very important point. And finally, we have to look at environmental stressors. And the, the data is now emerging that environmental stressors is a serious concern for, the, for a child in modern society. This, we believe, is the reason why we see higher incidence rates of children in an allostatic load condition who live in a low-income neighborhood. It's because there, has now been a, there have been a number of studies showing us that the stress levels, pollution, noise, crowding, are much higher in these neighborhoods. So what it means is, if you come back to where we started, if it's vital for the child to be in level four in order for them to learn, for the child to be calmly focused and alert, and if it's the case that a child in an allostatic load condition is going to find it difficult to stay in level four, it means these children, for whatever reason, whatever's causing the, the load condition, these children are at a tremendous disadvantage right from the start. That doesn't mean there aren't things that we can do. In fact, that's the whole point of this exercise. The whole point of this science is that we are now learning what we can do for a child that's in an allostatic load condition. Trying to change the environment is a very tall order, but in the meantime, with these kids, there are things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to reduce the strain on them. And the last thing I'll say is the one thing we don't want to do is yell at the kid. The one thing we don't want to do is shame the child in any way. 
Because I, as I've mentioned, these negative emotions, anger, frustration, shame, are a tremendous strain on the child's nervous system. We, just have, we were just working with a child two weeks ago that was sent to us because he had been diagnosed with uh, conduct disorder. And the most dominant emotion we saw in this kid was not anger, it was shame. Okay, so we'll come back to that after, uh, I know it's, uh, Jane has a couple more points to make, we'll come back to this, but, but I just wanted to introduce her next slide her, her next point, because for, for Jane and me, this is the heart of why we're doing this presentation today. Yeah, good lead and thank you, Stuart. There is a tendency, and I, I talked about this earlier, and, and Stuart has certainly led us back to it, that dates back a long time in our history, to ancient Greeks actually, to somehow see kids as being responsible, that they're to blame for poor self control. Somehow you can snap out of it and take control. And we actually tend as a society to put that blame on kids rather early in life, long before they hit the, uh, the formal school system. We, uh, we, ferber, we talk about ferberizing or allowing uh, babies to cry it out at seven months, to learn self-control to sleep. And we certainly uh, see it coming in at the school system often in our attitudes about blaming kids. And we, we fail to re realize and take into account um, that we need a different understanding and that it's very difficult for kids to inhibit their impulses. And it's different for different impulses. Stuart talked about the lights and being very tired at the end. I'm a little bugged by the lights not a lot and I'm going to be pumped at the end of this <laughs> because I always am when I do presentations I usually go into actually I go into hyper alert or beyond but uh, <laughs> we'll see uh, but but we're different we're all different and we react to stresses differently and to have the same expectations for all kids uh, around their self-control is a is a bad starting point for educators. You're never going to get there. They're never all going to be at the same point. And we, can, we recognize individuality on in a whole lot of other areas of development and early learning. But somehow we think, uh, we often think we can have a set of rules and it's the kids' self-control uh, problems if they can't all meet those uh, rules in the same way. And it really does take a fundamental shift in attitudes for, in, not just for educators, but for parents and others working with young children. We have to, we need to understand some kids, for all of the reasons that Stuart has laid out, have so much more trouble learning the skills that support self-control, and we have to think about what we can do to help those children master those skills. Sometimes it's our one-on-one -on -one interactions. A lot of it may be in our expectations in the environment. Sometimes we have rules where we insist everybody stop what they're doing at the same time and come to one place and sit down and listen to us in the same way. Um, and, and that may not be a reasonable expectation and is it absolutely necessary? Uh, so we need to think about that and then put a lens on our practice, on our schedules and routines. Um, we talked about, oh, we need to remember to do two things at the same time and change the slides. Um, why is it diff so difficult for some children to develop the self-control that, that I've mentioned? And one of the uh, reasons is that is this difference in the demand, the fuel demand, the demands that the, what we're doing, how it demands fuel, and the size of the cost will vary according to child. I don't think the lights are making as much of a demand on me as they are perhaps on Stuart. On the other hand, remembering what I'm supposed to do and keeping this going is putting a lot of demand, <laughs> this being the changer of the slides, uh, is putting a lot of demand on me. Um, so, and this is this very much has to do with our own individual skill levels, the environment that we're in, and what, um, what our own arousal state is. We all have different situations that put us over the edge, that push our buttons, that raise our state of, of anxiety uh, and 
kids are the same way. We can't expect the whole class to move forward at the same time. Kids need different environments, need to, uh, for us to accommodate the environment to accommodate them in, in various ways. Do all kids need the same number of calories at lunchtime to fuel them to the next meal? No. There, we have variations in our metabolism that require our calorie input and output and what kids need. And it's the same way with, uh, with, with what they need to uh, around the arousal, the energy that they do in managing uh, the stimuli that are coming in and keeping their, trying to regulate their arousal to that magic stage for calmly alert and focused. Um, let's take an example now about sitting in class. And suppose we're dealing with a child who finds it difficult to sit in class uh, for many different reasons. Perhaps the visual and auditory stimuli are very difficult and are distracting that child in a way uh, that they, it's hard for them to filter out and pay attention. And he find, maybe he finds the seat uncomfortable and it's taxing to sit for a long time. I find it personally extremely difficult to sit still for a long time if the seat is too high because I have short legs. And if I can't tuck my feet up underneath me or find some a ledge to put my feet on, I become a real fidgeter. And it distracts with my ability to pay attention, to, to absorb what's going on. It's just a very simple biological reality that I need to accommodate. And if the envir doesn't, environment doesn't let me, I want to stand up to be able to, or I want to get down on the floor. If I'm in an environment that requires me to sit in a, high, in a chair that's high and my feet are dangling, um, I, I have a very hard time with my self-control. Uh, and I think that's not so different from kids who, and who, who have various needs. Some kids actually need to be physically moving. They need to be standing and kind of futzing around a bit in order to take in the stimulation, auditory and, and visual and other stimulation and process it. So yes, they do need to move while they are involved in a learning activity or while they're living, uh, while they're uh, listening to us. And I think this is a real shift in attitude and it really challenges us to how we can accommodate when there are 22 or 23 kids. And part of that accommodation is in our attitude, I think, in understanding and recognizing this isn't a kid out to get us. This isn't a kid misbehaving and, and, and being defiant. This isn't, this are children doing what they need to do to put themselves in the position where they can come to that calmly alert and focused state. Jane wanted me to tie all this in to what we do in developmental neuroscience. So we study something very carefully called cascading effects. And basically what it means is take what Jane has just explained. So I can go into a typical classroom and I've got two kids sitting beside each other. And I've got one that's really paying rapt attention and the other one who's whatever, Jane's um, her feet are touching the ground, by the way, so. <laughs> um, now, we worked with a child, uh, we worked with a child recently that was having a considerable amount of trouble just inhibiting the amount of noise around her, and it was resulting in very poor attention, okay? Well, that makes sense. We've explained that, I think, fairly well. But now you start to get a cascading effect because it's natural for us as educators to pace the lesson that we're teaching at the kids that are fully engaged with us. Those are the ones we notice. Those are the ones who nod their head or who come up with, put up their hand. And this kid who's, who's really doing two jobs at the same time, this kid who is working twice as hard as the other child right beside her, is gonna to start to fall further and further behind. And now we get the kick-in effect of these negative emotions because she's going to be frustrated, she's going to be possibly ashamed, um, and th all this is going to make it harder and harder. It's not simply a case of saying that, that uh, she's not mastering the material at the same speed. She doesn't have the same resources available to master those, 
materials. And so to explain this, we wanted to tell you about some fascinating experiments that were done by uh, Roy Baumeister and tied into everything we said at the outset about Walter Mischel's tasks. These are called depletion studies. Um, everything that Jane just described to you is, is an example of a depletion effect. So uh, her having to do two things at the same time, to attend to the clicker, is depleting <coughs> the resources that she has available to pay attention to what she's saying, think through her answers. Baumeister did something very interesting. So you take these kids that did really well on the Michel task, the 30% that go on to get these great results. Now you begin to see where we're heading with all this. These are the kids that for one reason or another are not burning as much energy in the classroom. They don't have the same biological or social stressors as the other kids. That's why they've done better. That's why they are differentiating at the age of four. So what Bob Meister did was he took those kids, those 30%, and he tired them. He used just a little math test. And then 15 minutes later, you retest them on the Michel test. And guess what? They can't do it. Okay? This is a fascinating result. So it tells us that what the Michel test is really predicting, what it's really revealing, are those children who are burning too much energy, those children who don't have enough resources left to pay attention. And the last thing I wanted to say about that is, is this the last thing I say now before the break? Paying attention is incredibly expensive for a child's physiology. Just paying attention burns a tremendous amount of energy. In fact, one of the most surprising results from the depletion studies is that having a child especially a young child, concentrate for 15 or 20 minutes will seriously deplete not only their concentration in uh, a subsequent task involving concentration, it will seriously de deplete their ability to self-control. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jane said it's so important for us to, to have this change in attitude. Because now what we want to do is we want to look at these kids with an entirely new lens. We want to stop blaming the kid. We want to stop introducing any kind of negative attitudes towards the child. And we want to recognize that there really is no such thing as a bad kid. And there's no such thing as a stupid kid. And there's no such thing as a lazy kid. These are children. But if we do the wrong things, if we introduce all these negative emotions, then we can turn him into a bad, lazy, or stupid kid. And that's the point of today. That's what we're getting at here, why this change of attitude, this scientific knowledge, is so vital for transforming educational practice. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. I think that point is really worth stressing. And then the title of the, what I'm going to talk about now is Understanding a Child. There is no such thing as a lazy child there is no such we know there's no such thing as a stupid child I think we accept that understand that that's part of our value system as educators but there is also no such thing as a lazy child there is no such thing as a child who is whose primary purpose is out to get us they feel that way some days but we had we need to uh, think about it in a different way. Self-regulation is absolutely critical for children to engage in social, the kinds of social experiences that enable that child to learn cognitive and regulating skills that underpin self-control. They're absolutely essential. We're not going to be able to move forward to support early learning, to support the child getting along with the world if we don't pay attention to that at least not in any lasting way. Only in super behaviorist approaches may give you some short-term little blips and wins, but in the long term, you're not going to get very far. Uh, a child who has difficulty in engaging in critical social experiences because of this significant drain on the nervous system can indeed be helped, but only if we recognize and acknowledge those needs. Now, if you're asking yourself, but how do I do that with 23 of them or 25 of them or how many ever you have and you have all kinds of other coming on you, you have parents who expect things, um, 
you would be surprised, I think, by how far you get by just recognizing that and accepting that. You take a load off of your own back when you accept that children have different needs and it's not reasonable they're all going to be at the same place at the same time. That it, you're not trying to drill down, drill in, pour in self-control. That you're going to have to accept kids have different energy levels. It's not the whole ball game, but it does take educators a fair distance and it makes a difference on your presence in the room. If we acknowledge that the parent of a young infant is critically important in co-regulating that infant in the way that Stuart has talked to us about, then we also must recognize our role as educators in the classroom. And what we bring into the classroom, our own states of arousal, our own anxieties, our own ways of self-regulating, has a whole lot to do with how the kids are doing. And those kids, who are struggling the most are the most sensitive to your state and your arousal and what you do. A very, this is a bit simplistic, but just as an example, when things are getting a little rangy in a room with many children and the noise level is high and kids are flitting around and things are, you know, verging towards that flooding state across the board, we often raise our voices, we often speak faster, we often get anxiety in our voice, and all we're doing is upping the ante. If we sit back, take two breaths, and bring our voice down, if we actually bring it down to a lower tone and speak a little more slowly and speak a little quieter, it has, it, it has a big effect. And if we take that through and think through other ways in which we can help co-regulate the group when that's what they need. They need our support in doing it just by our presence, how we use our voices, how we use our, our bodies. Uh, it can, that understanding can go a long way. By knowing the child who, while you're talking to the group, could really use your hand on their shoulder uh, makes a big difference. In, that comes from understanding the child and thinking about this whole concept of self-regulation. Which brings me to a favorite topic of mine, and that is why play, the play of children, is so important to self-regulation. Now my background, I am an early childhood educator, and play is our mantra, and it's core to how we work with children. But I'm here today to say it doesn't end in, in early childhood, it doesn't end in kindergarten, it doesn't end in grade one. The play may change, and should change, and how we work with that play may change, but change remains incredibly important to self-regulation from early childhood through middle childhood, through adolescence, through adulthood. In fact, some of us self-regulate a whole lot better when we have play in our lives. Some of us do our most creative thinking and planning when we're giving ourselves some unstructured playtime somewhere, somehow. So I think we, the ch we need to come back to this. That doesn't mean we're throwing out learning expectations. That doesn't mean children learning to read and write to be critical thinkers doesn't matter. It does mean that recognizing that children who thrive in primary school are those who have strong self-regulation skills. They're calmly focused and alert. They can remember on purpose. They communicate effectively. They make friends and know how to use their friends to support their own learning. They are persistent. They stick with things, even while through the tough parts. And they're creative in completing tasks. These are all part of children with strong self-regulation skills. These children have developed their abilities to imagine, to use mental representations, to act in a deliberate, planned manner. They're able to integrate their emotions and thinking in, in ways that allow their uh, learning to become more complex and move forward. You all know who some of those kids are. And when you think about it, they all have strong self-regulation skills. 
Well, guess what? Guess what play develops? That same list of skills that I just went through and is on the slide. Those same skills are what our play provides such opportunities. It provides opportunities to make connections, to make links. We can stay with the task. We can get through the hard part sometimes in a play situation before we apply it in a more task-focused or product-driven situation. So sociodramatic and pretend play that are complemented by constructive play or play where we're put creating things, making things, really strengthens and provides opportunities uh, for, uh, for, for building those critical skills of self-regulation. So I want to talk for a moment about the power of play. And I want to put out something that sometimes I get a lot of criticism for, but I'm going to put it out here anyway. I maintain that play accelerates learning. If you want to motivate children's learning, you need to increase their opportunities for rich and deep complex play. Play where there is a challenge for children and it doesn't end at four years old or five years old, you continue that through. It may look different, it may be structured different, but I would maintain that you actually accelerate learning. And how that works, how play is so powerful, there's a number of points here I want, I want to go through. First of all, play that really engages children has to emerge from what really interests children, and therefore they are engaged in the focus. So if we seek out what, en what engages children, we're halfway there to figuring out how, on how we can increase their ability to be focused and alert and attend. And there's no better way to do that than to see what happens during play, to really be attentive to what children choose to do and what gives them joy. Play demands play with other children demands perspective taking. You have to figure out what others think and work with that and respect that. Isn't that what empathy is? Empathy is something that we hear a lot about, the being able to take and or put ourselves in someone else's shoes and take on, understand the feelings of others. You have to do that in play with other children, particularly pretend play that can become very complex as children become more skilled in it. Play encourages communication about what one wants and what feels, and we have to put that forward in a way uh, that's understandable and acceptable to who our co-players are, and that's a very important part. Play demands that we make connections between objects and people and things. As the play becomes more and more complex with a bigger script involved in the situation of pretend play, we have to be able to make more and more connections. We draw more materials into that play. We need tools to develop the props for that play, all developing more and more complexity for making connections. Play that is extended, that's ongoing, uh, provides challenges that children can take on. Physical challenges, emotional challenges, cognitive challenge, problems to be sorted out and figured out. It requires a lot of self-direction to maintain. It's not maintained by the teacher's script. It's not maintained by uh, a rule book or worksheets. It's maintained, the self-direction has to be internal or the play ends. And I think one of the most exciting things about play in classrooms and play in elementary school all the way through is it identifies for us the questions that can initiate extensive and, and very interesting inquiry projects. Uh, I think we'll come back to that at the, that point at the very end of, of this presentation. But as we struggle to engage children, what would really engage them is off, can often be there right in front of our eyes in play. So I'm one, hoping I'm making a little bit of a case for thinking about play is something that is very valuable. It's not just something we do to let off steam with kids at the end. It's something that we can gain from, so much from, and support what we do to support self-regulation uh, skills in the classroom. So now I want to ask you another question to talk about with each other or to think about yourself if you're alone and, 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 and at your computer. Is play central or is it an afterthought in your classroom and in the environments that you're with with children? 
Do you really pay attention to children's play? Do you pay attention to what's exciting at recess and what children gravitate to? Um, and, or do you use it as a way to manage the classroom? Just get those kids over there to go play while you get on with the important learning activities. Okay. Um, can you identify negotiation, perspective taking, uh, empathy and communication skills that children use in their child-directed play, either in the classroom or on the playground? Can you think about children and identify some of those skills? And how is your classroom environment set up to encourage extended, rich, and deep play that elaborates uh, children's abilities? It's been incredible. Both Stuart and Jane, thank you so much for that segment. Uh, our, our audience here in the studio has really appreciated it. About three minutes now for you to ponder some of these really big issues. I know it's not enough time. I apologize for that. But about three minutes. Tune us out if you've got a big group. Leave the conversation going if you'd like to listen in. And keep those questions coming. We're going to take some questions when we come back uh, with Stuart and Jane. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, first of all, we'd like to tell you that the book that uh, Jane and Stuart mentioned, Calm Energy by Robert Thayer, is a book that we'll post up on the website so you'll be able to get the information. It's on my bedside table at home. I'm looking forward to reading that. Stuart's going to talk with us a little bit about the work that Adele Diamond at UBC is doing. It's one of our questions that have come in from you. Adele's done research on how play develops executive function in children's brains. Stuart. Uh, so this is an easy one. This is, uh, this is a nice <laughs> one for me to answer. I've learned more from Adele Diamond than any other scientist in the world. Uh, wow. um, and it's true. And I've learned not just on the brain side, but also on the behavioral side. Um, Adele's work is on, it's on executive functions, as the question asks, uh, which is, if you'll remember, level three in the five domain model of self-regulation that we presented. And if you'd like, there's a wonderful summary of Adele's ideas in a paper that she published in Science, November the 30th, 2008. And I would suggest you get the online version, which has a, uh, an addendum. Uh, and I believe that Jane is going to touch on this in her answer to the next question. What's wonderful about the work that Adele has done recently on a model called Tools of Mind is that she has tested a number of very practical techniques for enhancing uh, self-regulation at this cognitive level, the level of executive function. She has tested these methods that you operate in preschool and in primary school years, and it works. They do work, and she's shown that they work. So we're all very excited about it and actually trying to talk Jane into letting us test this out in Ontario. <laughs> okay, so we have a question for Jane too. Thanks, Stuart. Jane's question comes from the field also, and it says, I've recently been very deeply engaged in two university courses on Vygotsky. I hear some of his ideas in your comments on play. Is it a coincidence, or perhaps does he influence your thinking? Well, I think as Stuart has hinted at, absolutely very much. Vygotsky's um, uh, theories uh, of uh, child development, I think, is quite, uh, certainly a strong part of my foundation and my thinking, and I think Stuart as well. It's also very uh, complementary to the concept of self-regulation. Vygotsky talks about uh, scaffolding children's learning and he, he put he uh, very much put the highlight on the sociocultural environment and the zone of proximal development and this is really how we support children's self-regulation is by bridging by finding the zone uh, and and doing the dance with the child to help them regulate to help them develop those skills so it's in, for Vygotsky the social relationship was the vehicle for learning. When we talk about supporting children's self-regulation skills, social relationships are the vehicle to do that. And certainly if you do look at tools of mind, uh, you will see the strong influence of Vygotsky and Adele Diamond's work. So as in most things, this is really a con the concepts that we're talking about today around self-regulation knit together uh, a number of big ideas uh, that are informing our practice right now, I think, in the, as we move into the 21st century. 
Thank you so much. It's hard to believe, but we're actually heading into the summary of our uh, webcast today. Uh, it's amazing how quickly the time is going here. We're heading into the summary, and Jane and Stuart are going to um, wrap this up, and we're going to ask you to keep your questions coming in because we're going to do a very nice section at the end with your questions with Jane and Stuart. So back to you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, I'm going to talk just, and we've had some discussion about these, so I'm going to be fairly high level and quick as we go through this, about specific practical strategies for educators. So this is all fine and good, Stuart. We like the stories, we get the braking and the gas pedal, but what do we do when we go back to the classroom? And there, there is no magic tips for teachers. There is no quick hits or if you do these 10 behavioral strategies, magic, you know, it'll all work. But there are some ideas, I think, that can influence practice. And I, I would argue again, start with really thinking about how you understand children and their individual arousal levels. And then think about the stimuli that are in your room and which ones seem to calm and which agitate. You would not want lights like Stuart and I and Kathy are facing right now, for instance. These may seem like small things, but they make a big difference. So pay attention. And you all know about the crooked picture on your wall that you can walk by 29 times and then your cousin who's highly critical comes over and notices it as soon as they walk in. We forget, we get used to criminal, uh, criminal. We get used, <laughs> maybe that too. We get used to those stimuli that may be agitating us. We accommodate them. So pay attention, fresh eyes. Um, schedule for pretend play opportunities. It may happen in different ways in the primary grades, but bring it in, bring it in with extended time and treat it as absolutely valuable time for you to figure out where kids are at and, and where they are. Uh, play games with rules that challenge and encourage children's abilities for in, in, to inhibit impulses to, to uh, take turns and that sort of thing. And Adele's book, uh, Tools of Mind, has lots of good ideas for that. Use children's questions and passion, what they really matters to them, to launch inquiry-based projects that can provide rich uh, learning experiences. And make follow and discuss plans. Make plans with the children about what's happening. Follow those plans and discuss what happened and do the same with their plans. And those are some of the strategies that I uh, uh, use in my own practice and encourage students in practicum to use. Well, we thought uh, we'd end this presentation by returning to the point that we started off with. We started off by saying that we are experiencing a profound revolution in education and in educational theory. It's a revolution that's grounded in self-regulation for all the reasons we've tried to explain today. But this isn't simply a revolution about how we can get children to higher levels of literacy or numeracy. This is a much more profound revolution. When we talk about the uh, revolution in educational thinking in the 21st century, our hope and our belief will that as a society, we will come to recognize in teachers the most important profession we have for ensuring the well-being of our society. This is a message that Jane and I have actually worked very hard to express in Ontario, and I believe with some success. And we wanted to show you one last graphic so that you fully understand this point. Uh, at my institute, when we first started to study self-regulation, we asked our postdocs to go out and find us all the research they could on self-regulation. This was in the year 2000. And they came up with this, and this is an absolutely riveting graphic. What's fascinating about it is that scientists in all these different areas were working on self-regulation without knowing that everybody else was. It's only in the last couple of years that we've begun to recognize the close interconnection between all these fields. In fact, I mentioned at the outset three huge papers that came out this week. Two of them are specifically about the importance of early education for a child's long-term physical health. I would strongly recommend that you read the paper by Terry Moffat, um, who is a very sophisticated neuroscientist. 
Uh, I don't think we have time now to go through the graphic properly, agreed? So I'll just explain the, uh, agreed? Yes. Yeah. So I'll explain to you in very simple terms what this is telling you. When you start at 12 o'clock and work your way down to 5 o'clock, these are all areas that we would study in psychology, ranging from, from problems of depression or problems of anxiety or panic disorder to problems of aggression or, or bullying to even problems as, as, as simple as being able to remember uh, what you've just learned or to think in a linear fashion. But as you start to go around the wheel, you start moving more and more into the physical domain. More and more, we see that, that the problems that can arise from problems in self-regulation can affect vital aspects of a child's long-term physical health. And then finally, you come at 11 o'clock to educational outcomes. This was really Fraser Mustard's great, one of his greatest contributions to Canada. Fraser was the one who recognized that there is a very tight connection between educational outcomes and a child's mental and physical health. It is not because the child who is smarter adopts healthier lifestyles. Fraser's hypothesis, which has been dramatically substantiated over the last 10 years, and this week in particular, was that it, there's a single pathway that's going on here. There is a single mechanism that is resulting in the child with high educational outcomes also having low problems in mental and physical health. It's one and the same thing that's happening. They will, they will manifest, if a child has problems in self-regulation, these physical and, and psychological problems will likely manifest at different points in the lifespan. The connection, however, is something that we can dramatically mitigate when we work with little kids. And so that's the final point that I wanted to make today. When we talk about the revolution that we believe is occurring in education, it is a revolution about how we, pre how we help children become healthy, active, happy individuals. This is about the health of our society. And this is why teaching is becoming, all of a sudden, what we've referred to as the guardians of the future of Canada. Okay, Jane? I oh, I was supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just, just... I'll do the first part and you can do the second. Okay. Jane wanted me to talk about one last part here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it was such a great note to end on. I know. It was good. <laughs> I was going to go with that. But uh, the reason she wanted me to talk about this last point was because Stanley, my, my, my partner for many, many years was Stanley Greenspan. And Stanley and I did a study um, uh, about five years ago uh, using uh, early screening tests you, as, as a an indicator of a child's uh, psychological and, in fact, physical health when they entered the school system. What we discovered was that these, these screening tools are pretty good. They're pretty useful. If you see them as a crude kind of tool, they're comparable. Stanley and I use the metaphor, they're like using a thermometer in triage. When someone comes into triage at the hospital, into the eMERGE department, uh, and they take your temperature, all the thermometer is telling you is there might be a problem here. In fact, the thermometer might be wrong, there might not be a problem, and it certainly doesn't tell you what the problem is. That's the point of these screening tools. It's to alert us to when we have to look a little bit more carefully, when we have to dig a little deeper. So the question that Stan and I asked ourselves was, how long does it really take us to get to know a kid? And our feeling is a minimum of two months. It takes us that much time to begin to understand the child's strengths and weaknesses, all the variabilities. And really, it takes us a year to really get to know this child. And then we ask ourselves the following question. Who is in a position as a professional to have this much time with the child? Who is in that position where they can really have that understanding which can't possibly be obtained in a 20-minute screening test? It's only the teacher. So at the end of the day, what we really wanted to do in this presentation was introduce you to whet your appetite to where the science is today so that the next generation of teachers will have these tools not just to understand a kid, not just the desire to understand the kid, but as Jane has hinted over and over again today, 
to really understand yourself too because self-regulation at the end of the day is as much about us as it is about them. Okay. Thank you. That which leads us to, uh, carries on into uh, some things to take away and think about. And Stuart and I have had a lot of uh, late night emails going back and forth to identify what are some takeaway messages uh, of things to think about to reflect on your practice as educators. Uh, and one of the ones, just following what Stuart said, is to view standard learning outcomes, learning expectations, as byproducts, not drivers of effective curriculum. To think about them, yes, we want to be able to use them to monitor what's happening, but they're not the central goal. They're the byproduct of good curriculum, good pedagogy. Following on that is avoiding labels and pathologization of, of childhood. I mean, one of the real downsides of screens and tests of young children is to find a label and then stick with that label. And it is just as crazy as going into the hospital, having a temperature, and getting the label of swine flu. You know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not enough to go on. So we always have to ask ourselves uh, about that before we use labels and really what I call pathologize the child. Uh, recognize the limits of standard instruction and isolated standardized assessments and uh, isolated instruction of skills where we try to pull out a skill and teach it in isolation of everything else in a child's life. We're working against self-regulation, folks. We're working against childhood when we do that. Long-term observation and documentation of children's learning and their strengths, which is exactly what Stuart just referenced when we talked about takes time to get to know a child, is so much more effective in the long run. Practice what you preach. Recognize children as having rights for respect and understanding. Listen and respect and understand them the way you want to be. And we often, it's easy to forget that one. Think about what you're saying to a young child and think about if your principal came in and spoke to you the same way and demanded that, you know, made a note of your behavior in front of your colleagues in the same way, how you would feel. It's not a bad litmus test for, to measure what you're saying to children and to really make that part of your practice. It goes a long way to raising children's self ability to self-regulate. And is pay attention to yourself, as, as Stuart finished on. Pay attention to what pushes your buttons and ask why and dig deep. And I think, thank you very much. I'll end there. Pass it over to you, Kathy. Perfect. Thank you. Remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. My mind is just humming. We've got about 15 minutes, I think, for some good questions. And we've got some questions piling up on us. You can still continue to send yours in. Remember, if we don't get them on live now, we'll definitely get them uh, when we archive the webcast. So we have one here, I'm not sure who from, but uh, says, we see a lot of children who are highly active but seem to need to move around to learn and are constantly wrigg wriggling around. They never seem to be in stage four. Can children truly learn optimally when they are so active? Um, let, me, let me give you something wonderful to see on the web. Um, you know the TED Talks on the web? Yep. Ken Robinson has a talk. So go to Ted, Ken Robinson's talk on creativity. Mm -hmm. And he talks about Julian Lyme. And Julian Lyme was in England and she was struggling in school. And uh, her, her teacher said that she needs to be put on medication. Um, she needs to be put on, on Ritalin or whatever they were using back then. And mummy wouldn't have anything of it. Mummy thought that she saw that her child was, an, was just so happy when she was dancing that she took her out of the school and put her in a dance school, in the National Ballet School. And Julian Lyme went on to become not just a prima ballerina, <coughs> but, uh, but uh, one of the most famous choreographers for the National Ballet. She was also a fabulous student. The key here was and this is a point that Greenspan makes in his book, Overcoming ADHD, that Jane and I have talked repeatedly about the importance of being in stage four, focused and alert. In fact, the calm part is a term that we don't really even use at my, at my clinic. Kids don't have to be sitting still. 
to be focused, to be in stage four. And in fact, for the reasons that we've tried to explain today, for some kids, it's going to be aversive. It's going to be very draining to be forced to sit still. And the last thing I'll, I'll suggest you take a look at, if you're interested in this line of thought, is go on the web and look at the Foothills Academy in Calgary. Uh, and you'll think at first that this is Bedlam, um, but it's not. Uh, the results, uh, when I saw it, I was amazed. Kids are moving around, they're on exercise balls, there was in one corner kids doing somersaults, and everybody was on task. And they were on task for the entire day. So, is that an answer? You bet, that's an answer, thanks so much. Jane, how about this, uh, Kim from Coquitlam, who's doing her PVP at SFU, mm -hmm. says, why is self-regulation in children more prevalent now, question mark? Has this issue been around four years, or are we just noticing it now? Yeah, self-regulation has been around a long time, probably since the beginning of our species and before. I think we're coming to see different spheres of, of research, different lines of evidence coming together to see a common pathway, as, as Stuart talked about. So we're, we're labeling and calling it self-regulation and seeing things as more interconnected. In a way, we're moving away from the division of social-emotional and cognitive. You know, I'm getting on, I'm a little old here. And then when I first studied child development, there was cognitive development and Piaget's stages of cognitive development, and there was social emotional development, and that was Eric Erickson with a tad of Freud thrown in. And we really kept those as two spheres, and we talked about the emotional brain and the cognitive brain as if they were separate entities. And what we've learned uh, over the last few decades is that these things are absolutely interconnected. It is a totally false dichotomy to s talk about emotions as separate from cognition. Okay, they are entirely interrelated and connected and I won't, I, I can do a two hour uh, <laughs> and it's really good, but we'll do that another time. So they're totally we'll interconnected. And, and I think though that we're seeing it as a construct now of self-regulation. Also, both Stuart and I have mentors who have been talking, who we've learned about self-regulation from and, and worked with in our work uh, for a good 20 years. Mine is Marie Goulet at George Brown College, who's got some terrific tools, and yours was Stanley Greenspan. And they were both deeply into this uh, as an integrated construct 20 years ago. I think it is exploding onto a much broader stage now, and that's probably what's behind the question. Great. Can, Thank can, you. can I add something to Absolutely. Um, there was, a, there was a study published in the year 2001 by Sarah Rim Kaufman suggesting that there are very high rates of problems in self-regulation in seven-year-olds, in SK in grade one. And so uh, the person who sent in the question, it was really a very astute question and we don't know the answer. Um, they talked about 53% of kids having these uh, challenges. Is it because we're more attuned to this or is there something going on in our society? Um, and we always believe in erring on the side of being overly cautious. We're concerned about certain kinds of things that may exacerbate problems in self-regulation and by the same token, which are detracting from those experiences that enhance, that promote self-regulation. So what do I mean by this? Well, we're worried about TV. We're particularly worried about video games. And one of the problems is there have been some studies that were done in France recently on the effects of uh, video games and it let me just say because we don't have time it is very worrying it's worrying for neuroscientists the neural patterns that we're seeing but by the same token you come back to the question we had at the beginning because we now know that these kids are not getting enough sleep nor are they nor are they exercising playing sports which is fantastic for enhancing self-regulation nor to come back to Jane's point Jane was talking about the importance of social play for self-regulation. We're seeing a dearth, a, a, a lack of these ordinary kinds of social interactions that develop self-regulation at the fourth level. So for us, we always look at certain things as effects, not as causes. For us, if a child is, is watching too much TV, 
okay, we know that this is going to exacerbate it, but for us the question is why? Why is the kid watching so much TV? Why is the kid playing so much video games? Mm -hmm. And why is the kid drawn to high density caloric foods instead of, instead of the foods that will make him feel better? And the answers we believe, come back to self-regulation, the answers we believe are the more a child is having problems with self-regulation, the more drawn that child will be to these kinds of activities that exacerbate these problems, and the less they will be inclined to engage in those activities that enhance self-regulation. So that's my add-on. Perfect add-on. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one last question, and it's one that we thought we talked about it uh, initially uh, in the middle of the broadcast, but we saved for later, and it's a large one, I think. But We've only got a few minutes, so let's see what we can do, both of you. It's specific strategies for hypo, hyper alert children in the classroom. So lots of depth here, lots of breadth. Strategies. Give us some, st a good way to, st to end up with some strategies. That's you. Well, I think we'll <laughs> both take a turn here. Um, well, the overall classroom environment is a starting point. Uh, and, in, and having, a, I'll go back to my big three, the emotional climate, the organization and management so that it's a, a, a good organized space, and finally the pedagogical strategies that we're putting in place. And I think that those three things together help to create the classroom environment that helps kids across that continuum overall, and we can't underestimate that. Uh, specifically for kids who are hypo or not engaged so much, finding out what does engage them and we, use, we usually have to animate it a bit more. We have to put ourselves into it more. We have to, with a young baby who we're trying to upregulate, as Stuart said, we may become more animated to engage them and to excite them. Now we have to pay attention because we can push them back further in a way to withdraw from us. So we have to watch our stimulation, but trying to um, uh, get them engaged by our own energy, by our own excitement, is certainly one way of doing it. Uh, for kids who are hyper alert, looking at the stimulation in the room, and do we need to tone it down? Or, and do we have a place for kids? Is there a quiet place to withdraw? We all know that we like to sometimes withdraw from a big noisy crowd and find a quiet space. Are we providing that in our classroom to help the child who's, who's overstimulated, who's uh, moving into from hyperactivity into flooding? Sorry. Um, well, I do this for a living. <laughs> this is what we do in our clinics. So we work with kids that are in chronic hypo or hyper alert states and try to enhance their capacity to be in level four. Um, Maureen, let me invite everybody to Coquitlam tomorrow. <laughs> I'm gonna show you guys a video uh, that shows that we can actually do this, and we can do this with really, really uh, severe cases. Um, so it's a, difficult, it's a difficult question. It is something we can do. Our, we work on two principles, and the two principles are literally what Jane has just described. So in, in essence, what we try to do is we know that these kids are under too much stress. So that's our first thing. What we have to do is we have to identify and reduce whatever the stressors are, if we can. And the second thing we have to do is we have to build up the positive emotions. And that's what she was referring to with, you know, ramping it up. Because the positive emotions are going to fuel their desire. There is one thing that is absolutely vital that we have learned from every single kid that we've, that we've worked with. So, my supervisor at Oxford was Jerry Bruner. Jerry Bruner was a Vygotsky, and I'm a Vygotsky, and we really believe in scaffolding. But in scaffolding, what we're doing is we're trying to adjust the challenges that the child can meet so that it's within that child's reach. If we make a challenge for the child that's beyond his reach, the result will likely be shutting down or frustration or becoming hyper, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it's the child who has to make that effort. You cannot make that effort for that child. What you do with scaffolding is you let the child know, I'm here for you when you fall. You will fall. We all have to fall. We become great in education because we learn that we can recover from these setbacks and try and try again. This was uh, one of Jane's slides about six slides back, the importance of 
the importance of perseverance. Our firm belief, based on our work in our clinic, is that we have to have mom and dad on board. Mom and dad have to be active parents. Mom and dad have to be self-regulating as well as the child. But we can't force them to self-regulate any more than we can force the child. At the end of the day, what we can do is study, scaffold, and try to motivate child, family to make that effort. And if they make the effort, then the resulting feelings of satisfaction, the resulting feelings of self-esteem are genuine. They're gen they are grounded in the child's awareness, and the kid gets this. This was something I was afraid of. I was ashamed to do this in front of the other kids in the class who don't seem to be having any problems. They know that what they've achieved is meaningful. I think I'll stop at that. No, that's excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Jane. We, uh, we at the ministry, and especially my colleagues in the early learning branch, wanted to address self-regulation. What is it, and how, why is it important to learning? I think that it was really nicely accomplished in this webcast. Thank you a lot. And I look forward to hearing more about your time in Coquitlam tomorrow. So keep your, keep your questions coming in to us. Hang on here. Keep your questions coming in to us. And uh, we have a webcast coming up on, let me just see, Audrey, do I have this here? There we go. We have a webcast coming up on February 17th. Project-based learning, how does it work and where do I begin? And the presenter for that webcast is Sue Fraser. And Sue's in our audience today. Hello, Sue. <laughs> so we're going to look forward to that on February 17th. Again, thank you so much to Seward and Jane. And thank you so much to our colleagues at the Early Learning Branch, brought to you on behalf of the Early Learning Branch, Carolyn Hansen, Angie Kellberg, and Melanie Bradford. And thank you to Audrey for producing this and to the InSync crew, New Lions. So thank you so much. And thank you, Kathy. You're more than welcome. <laughs> thank you again.